Let justice roll on like a river. Let righteousness be like a mighty stream. May the dividing wall of injustice fall so we may all sit together at a common table. May the all-powerful word of God that never returns void accomplish his will of peace and equality so we may all sit together at a common table. May each one of us practice humility and remember God created all people the same. May we turn away from discord and hate so we may all sit together at a common table. May we stand hard against injustice, sow seeds of trust, service, and hope, and above all, love God and our neighbor so we may all sit together at a common table. Lord, may every valley be exalted and every hill and mountain be made low. May the uneven be made straight, the rough places made smooth, so we may all sit together at a common table. Amen. Hey, so grace and peace. Today's message is a continuation of our All Together Different Sermon Series. Uh, the world has changed because of the resurrection of Jesus. Everything is altogether different, and we are altogether different. And that's how God has called us to be, is different. Today's sermon is called An Amazing Detour. An Amazing Detour. So I'm not sure how you are with directions. Or let's, say, let's do a little survey here with directions. Raise your hand if you're good with directions. Raise your hand if you're just so-so with directions. All right, now raise your hand if your directions aren't your thing. Yeah, like we're all over the place. It's like Misty's like, look, Stan's like, that's mom. So yeah, so we're all over the place. And, and directions are tricky. I, I'm actually pretty good with directions, but there are two times where I got totally lost and totally embarrassed. I'll share one with you today, and I'll save the other for another day. But, uh, yeah, th this one was when I was a youth pastor, like, 20-some uh, years ago in Germantown, Ohio. And we were taking a trip to uh, a conference, believe it or not, in Muncie, Indiana, where eventually I pastored, just kind of ironic. And so um, I was one of those youth pastors that would put together a packet for all the drivers, you know, directions and maps. This is pre-cell phone, pre-GPS, you know, so old school, you know, with maps and little packets and stuff. And, and I would, we, we were driving like on a series of minivans, a caravan of minivans. So I was in, Stacy and I were in the front uh, minivan and all the other minivans, the parents were following, took the group to this conference in Muncie. And we got to Muncie and I got all turned around. And so the whole caravan is following me as we kind of move it through the city. And they're like, what's Pastor Paul doing? They called me PP back then. That's, that was the youth group name, PP. Yeah, I, I won't go there. Anyway, but uh, anyway, so, so uh, we were driving around the city, and I, I, I'm too proud to stop for directions. Anybody like that? You're like, I'll figure it out. I'll fi I got the map. I should figure it out. Eventually, I had to stop for directions, and I'm like, okay, we got a caravan, so let's find this place that has several parking spaces for the caravan. Let's pull in over there. So we pull in on the left, and I wasn't really looking where we were going. And anyway, where I ended up going to get directions was a liquor store. And so anyway, picture a youth group full of teenagers after that. And they bring it up all the time. Pastor Paul went to the liquor store. Anyway, so they went home, told their parents, Pastor Paul went to the liquor store. So anyway, Rebecca brings it up on occasion. Rebecca, when, we, when we're sitting around the table eating a good meal, Rebecca, Rebecca always goes, remember when, and she tells a story. Recently she did that. Remember when Dad went to the liquor store? So anyway, that's my fu uh, fun little first story and the other one I'll share another time. But directions are kind of interesting, um, and, and with GPS it makes it much easier. But I, I guess there's a real question when it comes to the sermon that we need to wrestle with. Is, it's not uh, how are we with directions, it's how open are we, how open are you to following God's direction for your life? And I know that's probably all of our desire, we want to go where God wants us to go. But here's the second part of the question that really comes up in today's message. How open are we to follow God's direction even if there's a detour ahead? And, and I'm really good at following God's direction, but when there's a detour, when he wants me to go someplace else outside my comfort zone, I really struggle with that. I don't know about you, but sometimes God like leads us in places that stretch us and it's so uncomfortable and scary, 
Like, what are you doing, God? I don't want to go there. I don't want to talk to that person. I don't want to forgive that person. But he continues to push us. And, and I think detours are a part of God's plan. And when we look at the book of Acts, there's detours everywhere. I mean, just every one of these sermons in the book of Acts since Easter has been detour and surprise and interruption over and over and over again. Paul's on Damascus Road, boom, right? Blinding light. His life is totally changed, right? But then you look at Peter and what Peter's doing. And, and last week on the rooftop, and then all of a sudden he's eating with Gentiles. I mean, then we got the Tabitha story. And, and so Peter ends up with the widows and there's a resurrection. And it, there's all of these crazy things that are going on. And, and so for me, as we're looking at these texts, I'm asking myself the question, God, what do you want to do in my life? And the direction I'm heading, I believe, is the direction that you want me to. But are you leading me on a detour? Are you taking me a different direction? Is this like the book of Acts where you want me to leave my comfort zone? I mean, I, the more I think about comfort zones, I really think that God, God desires discipleship is the stretching outside of our comfort zone. And, and I believe life begins, abundant life, begins when we kind of move out of our comfortable space. And so today I really want to wrestle with that. I want to wrestle with the detour that Paul goes through in the text. I want to wrestle with the detour that Lydia goes through. But I also want to wrestle with the possible detour for us as a church and individuals. Is God taking us in a surprising new direction? And what does that really mean? So here's some what-if questions today. What if God is going to take us on a detour? Changing directions from what we're used to and sends us out to do something new? What if God is on the move, and I believe that wholeheartedly, and sending us to people and places outside our comfort zone? And what if some of the people that he's sending us to, God is leading us to share our table with? And what if God desires for us here at Sandy Hook UMC to be a catalyst of kingdom growth like those people in the book of Acts? What if God's wind, his Holy Spirit, is blowing us in ways and places that are completely uncomfortable. And, 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 and I know this is crazy right here, but what if God's calling you and your friends to plant a church? What if? Today's big idea is, it was actually shocking to me when uh, it, it clicked. Um, Rebecca and I sit down, my daughters sit down every Wednesday. Um, oftentimes there's other pastors who join us and we sit down and wrestle the text and sometimes these ideas just pop out and, and this one came to us, the big idea. says, God's detours lead us to the table. God's detours lead us to the table. I, I'm praying today that this will become clear as we go through the text. So Acts chapter 16, verses 9 to 15. Uh, Jason read it and you did a great job on the cities, by the way. Nailed it. Um, God's on the move. People are being healed and people are being transformed and the Holy Spirit is moving all over and there's detours and there's surprises and change of directions in Peter's life and Paul's life and Tabitha's life and Cornelius's life and they're all getting caught up in this new thing, this move of the Spirit and it's spreading like wildfire and so that's where we are today. So Paul, the Apostle Paul has this group of people that he's traveling with. It's, it's Paul and Silas Timothy and Luke and some others. So there's a group and they're traveling and they're going to Asia and, and, and they think they're going to uh, reach gent, uh, Jews. And they're headed this way and, and that's what their, their, their goal is, is to reach Jews and, and they're moving this direction. All of a sudden there's a change. It's like Paul's like, I'm not supposed to go this way. And so he turns and there's this vision. And so check out uh, verse 9. I'm reading out the message. Uh, that night, Paul had a dream. Uh, a Macedonian uh, stood on the far shore and called him across the sea. Come over to Macedonia and help us. The dream gave Paul his map. He went to work at once, getting things ready to cross over to Macedonia. All the pieces had come together. We knew now for sure that God had called us to preach the good news to the Europeans. The gospel had never been to Europe. This is new. Brand new direction. This is a detour, if there's ever a detour. And guess what they have to do to get there? They have to cross the Mediterranean Sea in a boat. And if you know anything about travel in that day, there were shipwrecks. And if you know anything about Paul's life, there will be shipwrecks. Traveling by boat is super dangerous. And so if I was Paul, and I'm not, 
But if I was, I'd be asking all these questions. God, are you sure you want me to go to Europe? I mean, those people over there might be really weird. What are you, what are you sending me over there? And then there's the boat. And what if, and what if, what if? Good thing Paul didn't hesitate. He got the group together and check out what happens next. So putting out from the harbor of Treos, we made straight run for Samothrace. Uh, the next day, we tied up a new, at New City and walk from there to Philippi, the main city in that part of Macedonia, and even more importantly, a Roman colony, and we lingered there several days. So they got in a boat, they traveled across the Mediterranean Sea, Mediterranean sea. they're in Europe for the first time, and they're traveling from city to city, and they're heading to a major city, the main city in that part of Europe, Philippi, which, uh, if we've read the New Testament, we might be familiar a little bit with the, uh, the letter to the Philippians that Paul wrote. Uh, this is the church uh, that is, is founded, it starts in this passage here, is the church that Paul writes to. And so it's a Roman colony, and um, what's important here about that mention of Roman colony, this was a Roman military base. Uh, so Rome is over here, and, and they put a military base over here to represent Rome in case there's enemies going this direction. So it's not part of Rome. It's separate from Rome. It's like an outpost of Rome. And so it's a military base, and it's all things Rome. And so all the Roman gods are worshipped and all those things. But guess who is not worshipped in that particular city? The god of the Jews. And so there's no synagogue which really sets up what happens next. Because Paul goes in with his group, they go to the synagogue, and there is no synagogue. Paul's typical pattern was to go and preach in the synagogues and tell people about Jesus. So he goes to find the synagogue. There's no synagogue anywhere in the city of Philippi. Uh, the rules are you have to have 10 men to form a synagogue. So in that case, at least in the, what it tells us, is there wasn't 10 Jewish men or 10 Gentile men, because this is a Gentile country that wanted to worship the Jewish God. So where do you go if there is no synagogue? You go outside the city to the river. On the Sabbath, we left the city and went along the river where we had heard there was to be a prayer meeting. So we took our place with the women who had gathered there and talked with them. One woman, Lydia, was from Thyatira and a dealer in expensive textiles, known to be a God-fearing woman. As she listened with intensity to what was being said, the master gave her a trusting heart, and she believed. So Paul and his posse go outside the city to the, uh, the prayer meeting, and instead of, remember the, the dream that Paul had, it was a man who said, come over and help us, and so Paul and his posse are going outside the city, and there they are, and instead of a man being there, there's a group of women, which, if you know anything about Luke, who's writing Acts, uh, he really shows all the time the churches represent women in leadership, and this is definitely one of those situations. And so Lydia is there, as well as a group of women. So let's talk about her for a second. Lydia was from Thyatira, a different city, so she's not at home. She's here to do business. She probably started her business in, Thi uh, in Thyatira and expanded it to Philippi. And so she is there, and she is a God-fearing or, or God-worshipping woman. And what that means, uh, just like Cornelius last week, it is a Gentile person, a non-Jewish person, that worshipped the Jewish God. They would be called God-worshippers or God-fearing people. But they're not Jews. They are Gentiles. And so Paul goes to this group of people, and he preaches this message to Lydia, who was probably wealthy. We don't know if she had a husband or not, whether she was widowed or not, uh, but we do know she was influential. And uh, uh, God opened her heart, it says, and when Paul and his group uh, shared the message of Jesus, Lydia opened her heart and accepted Christ as Savior. She was already worshiping the Jewish God, but Paul preached the message to connect the dots from the Jewish God to Jesus, and her life was transformed, just like Paul's life was transformed, just like Cornelius' life was transformed. And so we see this pattern that the Holy Spirit is bringing the apostles to people who don't know God, and their hearts are being opened. So the gospel is spreading. The message of Jesus is spreading. The kingdom is spreading. The revolution is spreading, and God is... Uh, 
is, is moving in the lives of people. Now, the interesting thing that takes place following Lydia's uh, conversion, if you, would, if you will, is that she insists that those people, Paul, Luke, uh, Silas, Timothy, and the group, come to her house for, um, to stay at her house. Hospitality, she opens her life and she says, well, if I'm a believer, then do this. And she insists. I imagine she begged. And, and Paul and the group said yes. And they came and stayed in Lydia's house. And here's the cool thing. A church was planted that day in Lydia's house. Picture all of these women and uh, Paul and this group gathering around the table, sharing in fellowship, sharing in uh, food, sharing in laughter, talking about Jesus, and a church was born around the table in Lydia's house. Now, the reason why this is so important, the same thing happened last week with Cornelius. And the same thing was going on in Tabitha's house. We see a pattern. What in the world is God up to? God is bringing people to a table and starting a church. A church is happening around a table where people are sharing a meal, they're laughing together, they're probably crying together, and talking about Jesus. A table is where a church begins, and it started in Lydia's home, it started in Cornelius' home, and we see this pattern when God is moving, and where is he leading people to? Where is he taking the detours? Where is he moving people to? He's moving people to tables, to eating together, and I believe it's intentional. Why do I say that? Why is it intentional? Why is the Holy Spirit doing this? Let's think about Jesus. Where did Jesus spend his time? He spent his time in Zacchaeus' house, right? He spent his time around tables. In fact, what did the people accuse um, Jesus of? He was a, uh, uh, a glutton, right? He was a drunk. He ate with people he shouldn't have ate with. Jesus hung out at tables. And what is the Holy Spirit doing in the book of Acts? The Holy Spirit is leading people to tables because at the table something transformative takes place. It's where we encounter God's amazing love. Think about it. You hang out typically with your family at the table. What is happening in the book of Acts? The tables, ex or the family is expanding. That closeness that you experience with, whether it's your spouse or you experience with your family, you experience with your kids or your, your friends and beyond, is it happening around, check this out. This table is sacred. It's where we share the communion meal from. It's the communion table. It's sacred, right? It's been set apart as a place where we go to commune with God. Imagine this. Your table at your home, that also is sacred. That is a place where we commune with God, whether that is our family or whether that is, in the case of the book of Acts, that family expanding to include strangers, including neighbors, that love that we experience at the table is a sacred place because at the table, we experience the presence of Jesus. That same Jesus that hung out with tax collectors and sinners, that same Jesus that hung out with Zacchaeus and other people around tables is the same Jesus his presence is at our table. I believe every table is sacred. The table at the coffee shop where you share a cup of coffee with a friend and talk about life. The table at a restaurant where you share and you connect and you build relationships. The table at your home and the table at church. God's detours lead us to the table. And that's the crazy thing. When you look at this pattern of the book of Acts, it's table after table after table. And what do we see in the Gospels? Jesus hanging out at the table. So the questions that I'm wrestling with today is you take a look at Lydia's story and the generosity and how she opens the table. And Cornelius last week opened the table. And uh, Paul and his, and his encounter and ends up at uh, somebody's house. And the, 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 there's this relationships are built in something sacred and transformative. His, God's love is emerging at tables. 
What does that mean to us? What does that mean to you? Now, typically, the table can be a guarded space. But what if God's trying to tear down those walls and who we meet, eat with? What if God wants to expand our family? Would you be willing to do that? And I think about that, that catalyst of a church happening around a table. Could it be that God wants to birth churches around our tables? I mean, that's so crazy, isn't it? I mean, to think about it. What if, what if, what if um, Stacy and I, our table, and Micah, what if God wants to plant a church in our house? And, and it's, what if God wants to do that in Dale and Julie? I mean, just think about it. That's like Book of Acts stuff, right? I mean, that's that crazy stuff that we see in the Book of Acts, and we say, oh, that was back then. But what if, instead of expecting people to come here, what if the church began to emerge around us in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in workplaces, in coffee shops, in the library, and wherever that relationships could be formed? What if God is spreading the family through the move of the Holy Spirit? God's on the move to break down the barriers so that true love could be experienced intimately around a table. It's like that video. All these people, and I think I love the Siwat prophets, the lyrics in there, talking about misfits and these things. That, that's who we are, right? I mean, look at us. We're a group of weird people. Amen? Amen. You're, you're like, pastor, speak for yourself, right? <laughs> I mean, look at us. Look at our stories. I mean, we're all coming from places of brokenness, and we're coming together, and God's putting us together, and that healing that happens at the table, he desires to happen outside the church. And, and what if God's bringing healing one table at a time? And what if that's the way that God wants to transform our city? Not by putting on an amazing uh, rock show with lights and fog machines and, you know what I mean, and get a slick pastor and skinny jeans and, you know. What? But what if, really, we experience love, not on the, from the stage, but we experience love at the table? And I know for many of us, us introverts, that is going to push us outside our comfort zone. So maybe there's a detour in your path. Maybe it's not going to be easy. And maybe there's a detour in the church's path. Maybe God's going to take us to tables. So questions, as we look at next steps today, is who is God asking you to table fellowship with? I mean, is it a cup of coffee at a coffee shop? Is there somebody that you've been struggling with that you want to, uh, you know, kind of break down the barriers? Maybe there's some conflict and you want to make peace and come together and forgive, you know, that kind of thing. Or, or is there somebody that God has led you in your path, a coworker or a friend or somebody from the church or that you want to go share a meal with at a restaurant? Uh, or, or maybe, maybe uh, there's a neighbor or somebody that God says, why don't you invite them into your home to meet around a table? I, what, what, what if that's what God's up to today? So I, I have a, uh, a little request for you as we wrap up. In your pews, pockets in front of you, are these next step cards. If you were here Wednesday night, you got a little preview of those. So this is one way that I believe that we can take next steps and make them real, is that whatever God's been doing and saying in our hearts, say, you know, Paul, I want you to do this, is to say, I will, and write that down. There's something about writing down what God desires us to do that's kind of really kind of this Wesleyan movement of accountability. It gives me the ability to take it from here or here to here. And then, and then the, the thing is, what do you do with this? I mean, for, for many of us, we can stick them in our Bibles and then get lost, right? But what I really hope that you would do is that you would give this to somebody and ask them to pray for you as you take your next step. Now, if you don't know who to give it to, um, as you leave today, I'll be standing at the door like I always do. Just hand it to me. And I promise I will pray for you. I, I pray for every one of these uh, and, and during the week. 
And it's just a way for us all to move forward. Because you know what? Every week, every Sunday, God's asking you to take your next step. And I don't know what that is. Your next step's going to be majorly different than my next step. And that's okay. Because the Spirit's working and the Spirit's moving. But what he's asking us is to, as I said in the front, is, is to listen and be obedient. And if we all do that, if we're all obedient to the Holy Spirit, is the Holy Spirit's moving, we're growing, we're being discipled, we're becoming more like Jesus, and, and the kingdom is expanding. But the opposite is also true. If, if, if we don't take, if God's saying, hey, Paul, I want you to do this, and I say, well, God, I'm pretty comfortable right now. I'm kind of in my zone, you know. I've, leave me alone, you know? Uh, uh, you know. And I don't take my next step. And, 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 and we begin this kind of thing of just being complacent. The kingdom doesn't expand. And, and the church becomes blah. But when churches made up of individuals are being faithful and taking their next step by the Spirit's direction, we begin to see that expansion of our lives and formation, but also the church. What is the next step that God's asking you to take? We're going to take uh, like 30 seconds of silence and just encourage you to jot down whatever it is God laid on your heart, and then I'll come back and pray. Jesus, for the pictures that you give us through the Gospels of you sitting around with broken people, celebrating and eating a meal. Thank you, Jesus, for those pictures and the encouragement through the book of Acts to be part of those things now. Lord, I, I pray for all of us that we would realize the sacredness of our tables and our homes and in the restaurants and the coffee shops, and also the church. You do transformative work around tables, and you're constantly leading us to more and more tables, to reach more and more people for your kingdom. So help us take our next steps today, Lord. Help us to open our tables and invite people uh, to share times of relationship building. Um, but Father, I just pray that we would be listeners and we would be obedient to the move of the Holy Spirit today, just like in the book of Acts. May you plant churches. May you build relationships. May people like Lydia and Cornelius come to know you. And may your kingdom expand in Columbus as it is in heaven. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us stand.